My film gives voice to those living with mental illness, our communities, and our families that can no longer afford to suffer in shame and silence. There are Ms. Graham. So just because I just got off the phone, Mark, uh -huh. a couple things. When they take you to this other place, yes. one, just re try to remember is that a hospital is not... If there's no red dragons there, if there's a red dragon there, it's all bad. Because okay. I don't get along okay. with the red dragon. Okay. I don't know if there are or not. I'll fight. No, okay, let me stop you right there. It really doesn't matter if okay. there is. Because if he's there, I'll take his ass out anyway. So okay. it doesn't matter. Okay, go on. But, so they're going to take you from here mm -hmm. to there in an ambulance. Okay, let me think about this for a second. Ambulance. Okay, so if the ambulance is going at its right rate, it should get me there in a certain amount of time. But if somebody tries to intrude and crash over and mm -hmm. kidnap me and hold me hostage, then we're going to See, you got to be able to ask these questions before you're at this door. Okay. They are going to restrain you when you go, so you can just get prepared. I know. It's a pain in the butt. <laughs> restrain. When you say the word restraint, okay. it's like a trigger. Yeah, I know. Okay, let me tell you. Okay, I'm gonna explain something to you real quick. When they say the word restrain, okay, it goes like this. One, two, restrain. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm kind of trying to give you a heads up. I had no idea about mental illness. My mother had no clue. If you've ever, you know, dealt with anyone who has any sort of psychosis, um, it's, there's lots of fear. And so there was one moment when he was in prison where they had to do a cell extraction, which literally means take somebody out their cell, but how they do cell extractions are just horrendous. He was too scared. And so they started tear gassing him and macing him. And I mean, that, I just think that's what you do to enemy combatants. <laughs> not people who are citizens of your country. And in jail, how was he treated? Oh, terribly. For what kinds of crimes? They're all, like, nonviolent, mostly crimes because he was in an episode. like a diary that I keep every time he goes into the hospital. This was back in 2013. It says, in the late afternoon from Justine that Monty was breaking everything, refuses to see psych doctor. He had pulled the back door off the hinges and broke the glass. Monty tells the doctor he wants to rip the doctor's eyes out. The doctor is very calm. Monty is growling at security. OK, you know, it just goes on, because this episode lasted last year for 27 days. This one, how long did this one last, like 19 days, maybe? 19 days, yeah. I just love my brother so much. Um, and he's perfect to me. <laughs> he really is perfect to me, so... Um, I feel like when he was diagnosed and when our family sort of really had to come to terms with his diagnosis, I just, I refused to allow it to um, tell a different story that I already had about my brother. And I refused to allow the stigma to sort of shape how I was gonna relate to him. And if anything, it just brought us closer. And I, I made it a commitment to myself and for my brother that I was going to be with him no matter what. Every downfall and every jail sentence and everything that was around his mental illness, I was going to make sure that I was way more equipped to deal with it than I felt like really society was. I met a lot of good people at the hospital. A lot of good staff and in, in, inmates, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of new friends. But, you know, they even said I could come back and visit if I want. You know. Let me cut that. Yeah, you gotta get scissors real quick. Okay. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like it was a positive experience. 
much. Yeah, it? it was rough at first, the first three days. I was in restraints. You know, but after that, it was positive all the way through. Yeah, one of the nurses said, are you yeah. taking Monty home? I said, yeah. She goes, well, he's so sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Are you taking medicine now? Yes, I'm taking my meds. I take Seroquel, Clonopin, Lithium, and Cyprexa. Does it make a difference? Yeah, well, I feel fine. I feel, I feel better than ever. You know, I feel healthy, I feel good. I don't feel no side effects like anything strange or anything. And it's okay. Um, do you want to let folks know that actually the food is done? Enough food is done for everybody. Oh, Paul, I'm right, I'm right here with Monty, Paul. Yeah, Paul. I'm right here with your nephew, Monty. Just hanging out. I'm all right, feeling good. How about yourself? I'm feeling good, man. What kind of party are you having? Just a welcome home party. <laughs> my mom didn't want to tell people about my brother's mental illness at first. She didn't. I think there's a lot of shame in black communities in particular around mental illness. Shame is dangerous because shame makes you hide things. And when we hide things, we don't get the support we need. And when we hide things, we're not as honest and transparent about our needs. And I think that um, shame literally kills people. Shame kills our possibilities of having something different. Monty had been off his meds, had a manic episode, and broke a window in a convenience store. With Patrice's help, his case was heard by a judge in a specialized mental health court program. Number 10 on calendar is the matter of Monty. When we were here last, I said that you were going to be evaluated both by the deputy probation officer as well as by the Department of Mental Health. I've got a report about uh, whether you would be a good candidate for this program. If you were to be placed into this program, it might do you some good. You're charged in count one with destruction of property with a value of more than $400. It's a felony. Do you understand the charge against you? Yes, sir. The maximum sentence for this charge, if I were to strike the strikes, is three years in custody. That would have to be served in state prison. That's not the sentence you're going to get right out the gate. But if you violate your probation, if you violate any of the terms of the treatment program, you could be sentenced to the maximum and the prosecution will be asking for it. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, sir. You have to undergo mental health treatment at the direction of the probation department in consultation with the Department of Mental Health, most likely for up to a year. It's going to be tighter supervision than ordinary run-of-the-mill probation. But if you're willing to do it, we're willing to try and hook you up with the people who can help give you help. Yes, sir. Until the court could find a treatment facility that would accept Monty, he waited in jail for four months. So, Monty, when did you realize that you had a mental illness? I was 20 years old and I started, you know, seeing people, you know, there's getting pointy. I felt like every, everybody was after me. I felt like people were, 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 were um, talking about me and I was just like, wait, something's not right here. And I said, why is my mind thinking like this? This is, this is abstract. This isn't normal. Black life, it matters here. Black uh. life, it matters here. <laughs> Black life, it matters here. Black life, it matters here. Soon after I got to know Patrice, she took me along on a vigil on behalf of a young man who had been fatally shot by the police. An LAPD officer, they say, shot and killed their mentally challenged son, 25-year-old Ezel Ford Jr. They laid him out. 
And for whatever reason, they shot him in the back. More than half of the folks who are being shot and killed by police have some sort of mental health issues. We know that Ezell Ford in Los Angeles, who the cops knew had psychiatric issues, shot and gunned down in his own neighborhood. My brother Monty, who's had run-ins with law enforcement for a very long time, he's a part of a pattern of harming, abusing, and often killing black people with severe mental illness. A lot of bad things have happened. You know, and I guess they look, oh, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a big, you know, black guy, and he looks dangerous, so we'll treat him that way. But that's the opposite. I'm, you know, I don't, I've been in very few fights, you know, in, in my life, and that's because I chose, I chose that. My hope is that we're going to intervene in the way Los Angeles treats the mentally ill, specifically the sort of cross-section between mental health and incarceration. You have to have lofty ideas and lofty dreams. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! There are currently 3,300 beds right now for the mentally ill inside of these jails. That's a problem. Ain't no problem. Why the people? Because the the people. During the second year of filming, Patrice co founded a new civil rights organization that would become a national movement. Pretty much all my activism, especially around police violence, especially around mass incarceration, is for my brother. Monty finished a year of treatment ordered by the court. He was taking medication, in therapy, and had a job for the first time in years. What's up, dog? I know just Yeah, I know you, dog. Yeah, man. <laughs> I haven't seen you in almost over 20 years, man. That's funny, a little boy. Looks just like son, man. <laughs> you. Know okay. Man. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody that has a mental illness is, is, is a monster. Have people treated you like a monster? Well, yeah, basically, yes. They're like, oh, there goes that guy. He's, he's a bad guy. Oh, he did this and that because he had a mental illness. That's what you know, my life story is. Hi. I just want to just live, you know what I mean, and be happy and just be left alone, you know? Hey, yo, yo, I got Jesse. your number. I'm going to text you. Be safe. Hundreds of protesters shut down a busy downtown Los Angeles street. Why they put homemade jail cots in front of the supervisor's office. The 100 replica jail beds we've created are far cry from the upwards of 6,000 the county is trying to build. We can't get well in ourselves. People with severe mental illness deserve care. Holding people and warehousing them in jail cells is not going to be the way. We have historically not fought for people with mental illness. People are rising up and saying, we are sick and tired of our families being thrown away, being disposable. We have to be a part of a growing movement trying to change the course of history. where custody and penalization takes priority over care and treatment. Uh, mental health conditions, medical conditions, they're not well served in custody settings. So Next speaker, please. As you know, my brother Monty suffers from serious mental illness. There has been no adequate treatment for him or people like him in Los Angeles. It's been criminalization and incarceration. We need a radical shift in the mental health care in Los Angeles. No dollars should be spent on a facility that locks away human beings who are suffering, who are sick. Do this right, do not compromise. Support the Montes of Los Angeles now. Next speaker, please. We won. 
Monty, we won. How are you doing, Chef? <laughs> we get to dream big now. Monty, we're gonna save a lot of lives. A lot of lives. When I was 14, my beautiful and kind 20-year-old sister, Meryl, suddenly became psychotic, roaming the streets of downtown Philadelphia. Meryl found her way to the apartment of our sister, Gail, and her husband, Bob. And Meryl was totally hallucinating, and she didn't know who we were, very paranoid. It was very scary. She was so frightened of us, we decided we'd, we'd have to call the police. My parents drove here, I mm -hmm. guess, the next day. And my mother was in the car crying and wondering why the hell they had taken Meryl to the hospital and going back and forth. My father was fuming. He was not very happy that you had taken her to the hospital. No, not at all. And Gail and I were beside herself. It was so clear that Meryl was out of her mind. Mental hospitals like the one my sister was taken to were far from ideal but they provided necessary care. It was at that moment, at 14 years old, when my parents took my sister out of the hospital against medical advice that I decided to become a psychiatrist. And when my parents and my sister Gail died, I was left in charge of Merrill. I hired doctors and social workers. She fired them. My family's house, now Merrill's house, was falling apart and becoming unlivable. Whenever I came to the house, she locked me out. In December 2005, I told her, you must move out. I need to get you help. After two weeks of her not answering the phone, I finally called the police. They found her dead in her bed at the age of 55 years old. No, she was just so sort of deluged by voices and ideas that were so scary. And when she died, I didn't feel a whole lot of um, anything. And it very much bothers me. Let, let me ask you a question. You ask me anything, but, uh, but uh, yeah. the mic's on you. So it's, a, it's a hypothetical question. How many years did your sister suffer with the symptoms of schizophrenia? Mm, solidly 30. So out of those 30 years, how many of the, what percentage of that time were your family persistent in supporting her and helping her deal with those symptoms? Fractured. Yeah. And so this is society's response. When society feels like no matter what effort is put forward, what resources are put forward, this problem doesn't go away or it, it only has a very minor small impact, people get frustrated.
people give up on their own family members. So if people give up on their own family members, if people ultimately give up on themselves through suicide, what makes you think that society as a whole isn't going to give up? 